David McKinster again, and this lecture is called What is Truth? This corresponds to the assigned readings in Bertrand Russell's The Problems of Philosophy. It sort of dovetails with the uh, previous lectures that are based on that book, but like those lectures, it's also going to go a little farther. Um, <clears throat> very famously in the New Testament, um, Jesus is being interrogated by Pontius Pilate, and Jesus says something about coming into the world to bear testimony to the truth, and Pilate replies, what is truth? Which all the Romans seem to think is a, is a really funny joke. Uh, why would they think that? These are classically educated pagans, these Romans, Pontius Pilate and his cohorts. And of course, what he's doing is, interestingly enough, uh, he's sort of doing something Socratic, you know, but what is truth? And so, oh Lord, no, he's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna do like Socrates, which Jesus doesn't answer, although that would have been an interesting conversation. But this is a question which um, always reminds me of what St. Augustine said about time. Of course I know what time is, unless you ask me to explain it, and then I'm at a complete loss. Most people feel that, uh, you know, feel the same way about truth. What is, well, if you ask what is truth, well, you know, it's like stuff that's not false. Well, isn't that circular? Um, mm. <laughs> okay. Um, and indeed, Russell does say that any adequate theory of truth must also have an account of falsehood. Okay. Plato dedicated an entire dialogue to understanding the nature of falsehood, uh, what's called the sophist. Okay, Russell talks about primarily the correspondence theory of truth, the coherence theory of truth, and then talks about the pragmatic theory of truth just enough to dismiss it. And we're going to try to give it a little better, a little better, more sympathetic treatment here. He also talks about knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description, and I'm going to try to show that it's the commitment of Russell to a correspondence theory of truth that really requires him to make this distinction and to press hard with this distinction. I'm also going to talk about a contemporary problem, a gate through which you must pass if you study philosophical truth, called the Gettier problem, after the philosopher who uh, articulated it. And we'll talk about the possibility that maybe we need a sense of truth that isn't merely about propositions. Traditionally, Western philosophers at least have wanted to define truth as being a property of propositions. Statements are true or false. Okay? Anything that's not verbal, not linguistic, is not capable of being meaningfully called true or false. So, let's begin. The correspondence theory of truth is very often thought of as uh, the default theory of truth. If you don't think too much about it, it's probably what you'd come up with. And indeed, it does seem to be intuitive it does seem to work well for many instances of things that we'd say are true. Okay, the pen is on my hand. There's a statement, the pen is on my hand. Is that true? Well, actually marker, okay. <laughs> I know someone will say, wait a minute, he's trying to fool us, that's not a pen, that's a marker. Okay, the marker is on my hand. Is that true? Well, not a trick question, yeah, it's true. What makes it true? Well, according to the correspondence theory of truth, this state of affairs makes it true. Not another proposition about the world, but the fact that this state of affairs exists. The marker is on my hand. What makes that false? Well, here's the marker, here's my hand. You know, there's, that's the state of the world, okay? Um, as long as you're dealing with what British philosophers like to call medium-sized dry goods, <laughs> as your examples, that seems to work pretty well. Plato talks about the correspondence theory of truth in dialogue called the Theotetus, and he commends it as seeming to be very intuitive and straightforward for a number of instances of how we use the term truth, but he also raises doubts that it's completely adequate for, you know, for every way in which we use truth. Remember, Plato is one of those people saying we don't necessarily always mean the same thing when, we're, when we say that something is true. Okay. Um, for propositions about the way the world is, such as the pen is on my hand, ordinary material objects, uh, that seems like, a, like it would be pretty adequate, except for one thing. What does correspondence mean? How exactly does a proposition correspond to something in the world? Now, that would seem to be 
relatively easy to explain until you try to explain it. And then, in fact, it's, it's been devilishly difficult for people to come up with a, a, uh, explanation, an explanation of that that actually holds up to scrutiny. Uh, some contemporary philosophers defending the correspondence theory of truth have said, look, in any system you have certain terms that are primitives. Okay? I believe I mentioned those before. A primitive, whether it's in mathematics or logic or whatever, is a first principle that isn't defined in terms of uh, more basic principles. It's a, it's a term that is, in fact, defined by the way it's used. Okay? You have to have some, you know, some things that are, are undefined, Otherwise, you get into an infinite regress of definitions. Well, define what correspondence is. Okay, well, define, the, define what you're talking about in that definition. Okay, now define what you're talking about in that definition. And you can go on and on and on. It's an infinite regress. Uh, something has to be taken as, a st taken as a starting point, and then you understand what it's supposed to mean by demonstrating how it's used. Okay? Um, <clears throat> Correspondence is good for ordinary objects, but what about abstract general propositions? One plus one equals two. What does that correspond to? Um, hmm. Now that's a little bit more difficult to explain in terms of correspondence. If P, then Q, and P, therefore Q. Okay, you've seen that argument form before, although I just wrote it in notation. <laughs> um, what does that correspond to? There's no single state of affairs that either one of these corresponds to. Uh, because of that, some philosophers have been unwilling to accept the correspondence theory of truth as being either robust enough to explain everything that we need to explain, and some have rejected it altogether and said this is an example that breaks the back of the correspondence theory. Okay. Now for Plato and for Russell, by the way, if you, uh, this is not a particular difficulty if you believe that abstract general properties exist, you know, universals in other words, that universals are a real part of the world. Abstract general properties, okay, that's what these correspond to. Okay. But if you want a more trim metaphysics, if you're not willing to embrace the notion of universals, then there doesn't seem to be anything really for these, these kinds of truths to correspond to. Now, out of that concern came the coherence theory of truth. Coherence means that things hold together. You know, they make a sensible, intelligible whole when taken together. Okay? The coherence theory suggests that in fact, there are certain fundamental beliefs that we use to understand the world. What makes a proposition true or false is whether or not it is coherent within that set of beliefs. Some philosophers would want to say it's you know, within a set of a priori beliefs, and some would say, mm, we don't need to even go that far. It's just here are the working assumptions we use to get through the world. We call it something true if, in fact, it is coherent within that set of beliefs. Okay. Now, that seems to work fairly well for general abstract propositions such as these. But if you want to explain in what sense it's true that the marker is on my hand, all of a sudden this gets extremely awkward. You have to start saying, well, we're invoking these a priori, belief, a priori beliefs about space, time, causality, sensation, blah, 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 and building a fairly, you know, fairly elaborate and increasingly less plausible edifice to, to, to explain a proposition such as the marker is in my hand in terms of, of coherence. Okay? So they're kind of the mirror images of one another. Correspondence seems to work pretty well for ordinary objects, and unless you have a Platonic or, or Russellian sort of metaphysics, it doesn't seem to work as well for abstract propositions. Coherence seems to work pretty well for abstract propositions, but if you try to use it for everyday propositions about the world, it gets very clunky and is, isn't clear that it's really working very well. Russell also points out an additional criticism, which is still debated. Um, why can't you have several different sets of beliefs and say a proposition is in fact coherent within that set of beliefs. Several 
internally coherent but incompatible sets of beliefs about the world. Okay? Normally we'd say, well, if you have completely different and incompatible explanations about how the world is, either one or both of you is wrong on at least some respects. To say we have different beliefs is not to say that, you know, there are two truths. <laughs> it's to say some of us have got, you know, some of us have got an accurate understanding and some of us have got a less accurate understanding, or some parts of each understanding are accurate and others are inaccurate. Okay? The notion that people have different sets of beliefs doesn't indicate that truth is, in, in any significant sense, plural. Beliefs are plural. But I'm perfectly capable of having false beliefs, as is anyone else. You wouldn't conclude that if, you know, you say two different societies have different beliefs about the shape of the world. You wouldn't conclude from that that the world has no shape. Because, in fact, there isn't any truth to the matter. There's just sets, conflicting sets of beliefs. Well, the logic would be the same to say here that, well, you know, if, if you have two different sets of beliefs and each of them works reasonably well or reasonably, you know, faultily, <laughs> imperfectly to explain the world, that both of them are equally true. Okay? Different explanations can be more or less wrong. That's, that's the beauty of this, of the rise of modern science is saying, you know, as, as Socrates said, make your hypotheses, hold it up to scrutiny, test it out, and if it works, good. And if it doesn't work, you're going to have to revise it. And if you can't revise it to make it work, you don't get to cherry pick your evidence. You don't get to suspend logic. You have to abandon your hypotheses if you can't make it work in terms of the way you know, the world is actually presented to us. Okay? Now, on the other hand, we think about the, you think about the parable of the seven blind wise men and the elephant. Is any one of them wrong? Well, as the seventh blind wise man said, they're all speaking the truth insofar as they're uh, telling you their experience, but they are all speaking falsely insofar as they think that that's the whole story. And in fact, you might go further and say every one of them is speaking falsely. The one who said the elephant is like a great serpent because he felt the trunk would have been more accurate to say the elephant, the part of the elephant that I, that I touched, seemed to feel like a great serpent. I have no other reason for believing it actually is a serpent. Well, the part of the elephant I touched seemed like, had this, these characteristics in common with a great tree trunk, but you know, it would be hasty to conclude that it actually is a tree trunk, and so forth and so forth. In other words, the more cautious and the more careful we are about how we describe the world, the less, the less likely we are to rush into judgments that later can't be defended. Okay, finally, the pragmatic theory of truth, and Russell wants to dismiss that right away. Basically, pragma, the notion of pragmatic comes from an ancient Greek term, pragma, which means significant work. Uh, pragmatism is an American school of philosophy. Uh, it's not pragmatism in the sense that we use it in ordinary language, as in, well, I, you know, I don't, my values don't enter into it, I'm just concerned about what works. Okay. Pragmatism is a theory of meaning, and essentially what it says is that language is a toolkit. Not a tool, but a toolkit. It's a bunch of tools clumped together. And we use it for a bunch of different purposes, and the truth of a proposition depends upon whether, in fact, it is functionally adequate. Does it, in fact, achieve whatever it is that caused us to utter it? If I say, the pen is on my hand. What am, why, am I, why would I be saying that? You know, so that you can locate the pen. If I say that, does it in, in fact help people locate the pen? Yes. Okay, well, it succeeds. That's why we call it true. If I say the house is on fire, and in fact nobody can find any fire in the house, so is that true? No, that's false. Why? Because if I say that, you know, apparently I'm trying to say that, uh, that you're going to find flames somewhere smoldering, smoking, that it's dangerous to stay inside or whatever. But what, what if nobody can find anything like that? Well, then why was I saying it? Okay, there's falsehood for you. I'm uttering something that doesn't really have uh, the purpose that it pretends to have. Russell thinks this is nonsense. And he thinks it's nonsense because he says, of course, you have to be able to distinguish between truth and falsehood in any adequate theory of truth. And the problem with saying that a proposition is true if it achieves its end is that 
you can't really clearly state what the difference is between a successful lie and the truth. If I say, if I say for instance, um, Santa Claus is coming and he won't come unless you're in bed asleep, I might be able to get a child to hop in bed and go to sleep and that's my purpose. Okay, so I achieved my purpose. Does that mean that it's true that Santa Claus is coming? Bertrand Russell was actually rather fond of using that Santa Claus, uh, uh, that sort of Santa Claus example of how it is a proposition may be successful in its aims even if it is not true in the sense that we want it to be true, as in you know, presenting this is the way the world is rather than you know, telling us something about a world that doesn't exist and getting us to do something because of that. Um, <clears throat> I saw a, an editorial cartoon a couple of years ago, Socrates talking with Karl Rove. Socrates had his head in his hand, and Karl Rove was saying to him, but Socrates, if a lie is repeated so often that it is believed, does it not become the truth? Okay, now that's exactly what Russell is worried about. You can skillfully mislead people and achieve your end. And within, as, as Russell sees it, as Russell sees it, the pragmatic theory of truth cannot distinguish between doing that and actually, actually telling the truth. Now, there's a sense in which this notion of, okay, well, you test, you, know, you test your propositions by whether they have the effects you want. There's a sense in which that is sometimes certainly useful. Um, People who say daily affirmations, of course, to try to improve their attitude and hence improve their lives. Is it working? Do you feel better about yourself? Do you treat people better? Well, there's a sense in which there is some sort of truth contained, not because it's describing the world, but because it is, you know, it is promising to have an effect and it's having that effect. Okay? Very often with ethical precepts, I think, I, I think this is very close actually to David Hume's view about ethics. Ethical precepts are supposed to help us make life a certain way. The value or lack of value of an ethical precept is to be understood in terms of how it does or does not improve our lives. So the sense of ethical truth would simply be, does this work? We utter ethical propositions in order to alter our behavior, alter the behavior of others in a way that makes life better. Does it work? Well, in that sense, it's an ethical truth because ethical truths aren't about matters of material fact or matters of logical or mathematical fact. Okay? So there may be a sense in which this is actually a very useful way of looking at at least some propositions. Okay? <clears throat> Russell is committed to a distinction, and he has a whole chapter by itself on this, between knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description. And as I said at the beginning, his commitment to the correspondence theory of truth really requires this of him. Knowledge by description is essentially knowledge through language. Okay, just what it sounds like. Knowledge by acquaintance means that I am directly aware of something. Russell sp spilled a lot of ink talking in, in various books and articles about the implications of that. Do I see a marker? No, I see colors, I see shapes, I see relationships between them, or, or at least intellectually apprehend relationships between them. I infer there's a pen here. Okay? So what am I acquainted with? Things like colors, shapes, textures, sense data, internal states such as pain or pleasure, that's what I'm acquainted with. When I start inferring anything about that, when I start laying descriptions on those things, this is a pen, I have a headache, you know, whatever. When I'm describing it, when I'm saying this is the proper language to describe what I'm experiencing, at that point, I have uh, opened the door to the possibility of error. In fact, the further away from acquaintance I get, the more elaborate my descriptions become, the more the chance of error. That's a distinction that Rene Descartes also uh, worried about. Okay? My direct experience is, as he said, put it, incorrigible. It can either be improved or, or made worse. It just is what it is. 
But when I start trying to talk about it and say what it is and communicate it to other people, I'm adding descriptions, I'm saying this language rather than this language is appropriate. And at that point, I'm capable of committing error. Okay? Now, the dilemma is, the closer we are to acquaintance, the less useful <laughs> it is. Okay? Because we can't communicate it. The farther away from acquaintance and into description we get, the more useful it becomes, but also the greater the possibility of error. Okay? And Russell does talk about this, you know, the, you know, the elaborateness of description, which is necessary for everyday life, it's necessary for science, whatever. The elaborateness of the description increases the possibility of error. Now, how is that related to the correspondence theory of truth? Every description we have of the world has to do more than simply be logically consistent or consistent either with other propositions. Somehow it has to drill down to a direct acquaintance with the world. It has to be about what we really experience. Okay? That's his reason for making so much out of this. It's got to be about something. And it can't just be about other language. Wittgenstein, I'm mentioning again, Wittgenstein once said to his students at Oxford, he wrote on the board, this is a very pleasant pineapple. And he said, what does this mean? And his students replied, uh, this is a very pleasant pineapple. Well, where does the meaning come from? Um, from a thought? From a thought? Yeah, what's the thought? The thought is, this is a very pleasant pineapple. Oh, wait a minute. Where does the meaning of the thought come from? Uh, you know, what is this business about the language is referring to a thought? Isn't the language referring to, you know, expressing an experience that I'm having? Why do you need that additional layer in between? No, language has got to be about something. And Plato himself, uh, you know, long ago, <laughs> 2,500 years before Wittgenstein, said that language has to arise out of life in order to have any purpose in life. Wittgenstein says something very similar. Language arises out of forms of life and expresses forms of life. Okay? Russell is by, by no means expressing the same thing that, that Wittgenstein was expressing, but he is saying something that is, if you will, parallel. Namely, description has to be based on acquaintance because our language has to be about something. It has to actually point to something. The map is not the world, but that doesn't mean I can sit, just, just sit down and doodle and say, okay, here's a map. You know, the map has to actually point to something. Again, this is something Wittgenstein said. Some of our language says something some of our language, on the other hand, merely points to something. There's a, Jas a Japanese parable that, uh, uh, this is actually about religion, but religion is a finger pointing to the moon and we're all untrained dogs. How zen, huh? Okay, now what does that mean? Religion is a finger pointing to the moon and we're all untrained dogs. For our purposes, we could say, instead of religion, we could say language. Language is a, a finger pointing to the moon, and we are all untrained dogs. Have you ever tried to get an untrained dog to look at something? Look, Rover, look, 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 look. What's Rover going to look at? Your finger, because that's what's moving. He doesn't understand the concept of pointing. And that, uh, you know, the Zen parable is, is saying that, you know, religion, language, whatever, this is what we do. We end up staring at the finger that's doing the pointing instead of looking at what it was trying to point to. A part of what uh, Wittgenstein is saying is you have to look at what the finger is pointing to. And indeed, Russell is saying, you know what? The language doesn't mean anything unless it's a finger pointing to something. Okay. <clears throat> While we're on the subject of truth, I just want to briefly bring up something called the Gettier problem, named after the philosopher who proposed it. Uh, just to get you to think a little bit more about how slippery the notion of truth can be. There's a principle called addition in logic. If A is true, I can add anything else to it, and that compound proposition is true. You know, A or B, okay? I'll just, since we haven't really learned notation, I'll just put in the word or. A or B. If A is true, then the compound proposition A or B is true, regardless of what B is. My name is David, or I'm a monkey's uncle. Okay, <laughs> is that proposition true? Yeah. Obama is president, 
I'm still using this lecture in a few years, just note that I'm, I'm doing this in 2013. Uh, Obama is president, or I'm king of the world. Okay, we actually use propositions like that, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so here's the problem. Let's say my coworker, Henderson, has got a very distinct car, let's say a bright yellow 1952 Buick. You're not likely to see a lot of those around. Every day I look out of my window and I see there's that bright yellow 1952 Buick and I think, ah, Henderson's here. Now let's say that Henderson goes on vacation and I don't know about it and he goes to Barcelona. Well, let's make it even more elaborate. Let's say he goes to Timbuktu. Timbuktu is a town in Mali, the African nation. Let's say he goes to Timbuktu. Always wanted to go to Mali. Okay. Now someone comes in and says, is Henderson here? And I look out in the parking lot and there's a yellow 1952 Buick. It may not be his, he may have loaned it to a coworker while he's away in Timbuktu. And the person who asked me the question, so I, I say well, to that person, well, yeah, he's here. Are you sure he's here? I can't find him. Are you sure Henderson's here today? I look out, I see the car again, I say, look, <laughs> Henderson's here or he's in Timbuktu. And I mean that as sort of a joke, right? No, actually, it's true. Henderson's not there. He's in Timbuktu. I thought that this part was true, so I added something implausible to it for contrast. It turns out this is what's true and this, this is not what's true. Hmm. So, okay, one traditional way of looking at knowledge is that knowledge is justified true belief. I have a belief, the belief is true, and I can give an account of it. Okay, well, I have a belief, Henderson's here, or he's in Timbuktu. I have a justification. I see his car, that's good inductive reasoning for believing he's here. Plus this principle of deductive addition, I can add anything I like to it. So if Henderson's here is true, then Henderson's here or he's in Timbuktu is true. It's a justified, it's a justified true belief, but the problem is the part of it that I think is true is not true. The part of it that I thought was implausible is true. My justification is actually for the part that's not true. Okay. Head spinning a little bit? Well, the whole point of this is Gettier is pointing out the notion of truth is a lot more slippery than we might take for granted. Okay, we want to start investigating the nature of truth. We have to understand that there are a lot, a lot of ways that we can go astray, that we can misunderstand the nature of truth. Now, I want to add one more thing that I think is, uh, I think is important and just want you to consider this. All these theories of truth have pretty much made propositions or statements, if you will. Language, the bearer of truth. Most people who are artists, at least most of the artists I've known, would claim, you know what, in my music or in my painting or in my dance or whatever, I feel like I am grasping certain truths that can't be expressed linguistically and I'm conveying them the only way that they can be conveyed. Are there non-propositional truths? Well, none of these approaches actually do a very good job of accounting for non-propositional truth. It may be, I mean, essentially taking our cue from Plato that we don't necessarily mean the same thing every time we say something is true. It may be that each of these traditional approaches works pretty well, but for different instances. That truth isn't one thing, that it's maybe a bunch of things. Okay, and if it's a bunch of things, then maybe there's such a thing as non-propositional truth as well. In fact, in fact, wouldn't there have to be non-propositional truths for knowledge by description to be about something that's, that's true? Now, people sometimes don't want to use the word true when they're talking about acquaintance. They say, okay, well, rather than truths by acquaintance, we want to say that we know something by acquaintance. It's not truth, it's a fact. It's not something that's, that's linguistic. But I think there's something to be gained, perhaps, by asking, should we, in fact, expand the notion of truth so that it includes things 
that are in fact not linguistic. It's not just language that can be true or false. Okay? 